So that's a great look at, uh, at 3D finishing and using the OpenEXR workflow. The last little section that we're going to look at uh, here um, is, is going to be around um, what we're calling interactive 3D compositing. So deeper compositing, when you really want to get into uh, it's a heavy lifting. So again, we've got uh, various layers that have been organized uh, for us. We've got these guys that need to be uh, sort of keyed out and composited um, in a big, big scene where we're going to cut out these mountains and then put everything into, uh, into this waterfall. So, so this is really one of the signature shots in the entire piece. Lots of compositing work, lots of work went into this one. Exactly. So we're going to take this whole collection of, uh, of elements and we're going to, again, we're going to enter the, uh, the post-batch effects. And this time, instead of breaking everything out into action, we're just going to split everything out into tracks and layers. So it's a third option that allows us to get into deeper compositing because now maybe we want to organize these elements through a different series of, of, of steps uh, using all of the various uh, creative tools within Flames Batch environment. So in this case, we're going to do uh, a 3D track. So we're going to look at that again. So we're going to drop a, an action node into the waterfall plate. And again, go to the 3D tracker, but instead of this, using the auto detect, this time we're going to use the free 3D motion option because this was shot from a helicopter, uh, and that's a very uh, great um, uh, usage of the 3D tracker. The free 3D motion will actually enable us to, to capture that motion from a helicopter shot. So here, once that's solved, you can see when I scrub through, we've got our, our various tracker points laid out. Uh, let's again switch into a, a top view to look down on the scene, see what's been created. There's our point cloud. Another good way of looking at this would be to turn the background off altogether. That, that really helps you see and visualize how the point cloud has recreated that scene from that you know, 2D, uh, 2D scene uh, into a 3D environment. We don't need the, uh, the original camera anymore, so we'll go ahead and hide that. And let's put the, uh, the background on because what we want to do within the point cloud now is we want to figure out exactly where uh, we want to place objects in the scene. So it's really great that we get the point cloud and we also have uh, little um, tracker marks that we can select. So if I wanted to put something, and in this case I want to put the, the guys on top of the, uh, the waterfall here, I'll select that one point and create an axis. And notice in the schematic view now we've got uh, an axis that I can then change its name. This would be relevant for uh, use within a 3D application. So if I were to rename that waterfall, that name would show up uh, at, with that location in my point cloud. Um, so that would allow my 3D artist to, to use that uh, uh, as a relevant place, placement for some object in the scene. If I go to the camera itself, we can go to the export tab. Notice that I under the, the save option I have uh, film box, I have the, the option to include the point cloud. I can also include those uh, axes as locators. And again, I can just save that out for a 3D program like Maya. Now, now, in this case, we're not actually sending anything to, to a 3D program. That's just an example. What you're actually doing here is creating everything inside of Flame Premium. That's right. Now, once I've kind of got my location and all that sorted out, another nice thing to do would be just reset the tracker. That's going to kind of clean things up for me. And I'll go and add a new uh, input from my media. And that's when we'll introduce the, uh, the guys that are standing on top of the roof. Now, notice just scrubbing through the timeline, they also uh, appear to be moving, but they're not really tied into the scene just yet. And that's when you would actually want to connect them to the location and the, the axis that we solved. We would actually want to you know, stick them in the exact plane uh, in, in relation to the camera. And now if I, if I scale them down to sort of more appropriate size and kind of, sort of roughly place them on top of the waterfall for now, as we scrub through, you can see that our newly created 3D track camera is making them look like they have now been uh, placed on top of the waterfall. Of course, we've got more work to do. We need to go into the keyer. We need to key them out. So we'll use the master keyer, which is just uh, amazing. Uh, it's a great way of, uh, of doing keying. Uh, we can hover over any of the problem areas, or we can simply use patches. This is another sort of way of having a key on top of your key. Uh, and of course, we can also you know, shrink and erode our, 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 uh, our mat as well. Or we can go directly to our, our garbage mask tools where we can start to, uh, to mask out any of these areas that we do not want. So we need to obviously remove the building. So we'll just quickly do that. We can also have a combination of linear or bezier handle points, of course, and sort of clean this up, get this exactly as we want it. And then when we look at our mat, we want this to be uh, 
you know the color to be taken down. The other thing we could do is uh, is just you know use a hotkey to just freehand draw shapes, so we can have a combination of masks uh, here. In this case, we want that on the outside and bring the color down. And uh, of course, as I mentioned before, we can shrink and erode the edges. Now, if we zoom in, you can see this is working pretty well. I did a pretty good job of of, of placing them initially, I, eyeballing them into place. Uh, but notice if I if I place them on top in the center, the guys on the left and the right are not actually um, falling uh, on on the top of the the frame of the the waterfall the way that I'd like. So this is when using something called an extended bicubic comes in handy. We'll switch that surface to an extended bicubic and subdivide that surface. This is going to allow us to kind of bend and uh, and reshape this image to uh, to allow us to place them uh, more flexibly exactly where we want them on the uh, on the rocks here so again that's a, a, a nice tool for that and when we scrub through now you see that that extended by cubic has them kind of coming up over the uh, the edge of our scene now there's some other things that we might want to add into uh, this scene um, if we went to the the particle presets uh, the 3d particle presets tab let's scan down through the the subdirectories in the different categories here um, there are a lot of different useful things here um, for creating atmospheric type effects. Uh, in this case, maybe we'd want to use something like a waterfall. It's it's not uh, uh, it's a funny coincidence that there's one for the waterfall here. Notice I can I can start to place that in my scene, and if I rotate this around, you can see that they are in fact 3D particles. Um, because they are 3D particles, I can also light them, right? So I can I can start to add lights to the scene. Maybe move this light back a bit, change its intensity a bit, and as we scrub through, you can see now that we're our 3D particle generator is just pouring off some water in the, in the scene. I was going to say this is a great way if you want to get up to speed with particles quickly, you know, because you load the presets and you actually see how they're built. Yeah, exactly. So it's, a, it's a great way to go to school on how they're how to create your own particles. Uh, something that might be a little bit more appropriate for this would be um, maybe this atmospheric uh, effect where we've got the particles sort of coming up from below. Uh, from the waterfall below. So we're just going to move them down a bit. We could also go in and, uh, and maybe uh, divide the texture uh, so that we've got a little bit more of a white sort of surface coming out. And you get the idea with a little bit more time and, and, and placement uh, we can get something that would integrate pretty well into the scene. Now let's again move ahead. We'll, we'll go to our, uh, our final version of the scene. We're going to spring everything out of our uh, custom node bin there. And we're just going to feed this result back to our timeline. Now, let's take a look at, uh, at with a little bit more time and patience, what we can come up with is something that, uh, that looks like this. We've got uh, some foreground guys keyed uh, as well. Uh, we've also replaced the, uh, the volcano um, with uh, some more mountains in the background. And we've also got, uh, we've also got you know, some particles that, that have been placed in the uh, the bottom of the scene using that same technique that I was showing you before. If we switch to the the working camera view, this this highlights it a bit better. You can see now now as we scrub through, we can see that uh, we've got our, our 3D tracking uh, for our, our foreground elements, and of course we've got uh, we've got all the the cutout matte painting in the background. Now back to this this scene, what we want to look at now is is the multiple outputs from this particular scene. Now maybe we want to to use the multiple outputs uh, for grading in a little while. So so that's something that we can really set up here on the flame side to then reuse over in Luster. Yeah, and I think this again is really important. So what changes about using Flame Premium is uh, you really start to think about the options that you have. Not just you're not just doing the the visual effects. You actually have a lot more control. And in this case, and you'll see in a few minutes, we actually have. Uh, a full set of professional real-time color grading tools and while those color grading tools have great masking and secondary capabilities um, you've seen how Bill spent a lot of time getting these masks just right so this is actually a great way to take that data that was done in flame and reuse it in grading. That's right so if we look uh, at the multiple outputs I'm able to uh, to send those into a combined node where I can take the uh, individual uh, mats and put them into the RGBA channels to then use those inside of Luster. Uh, and then of course we're also going to export our, our complete scene and the mats to a specific location so that we can then 
uh, reuse them in Lustre uh, for, for grading. Yeah, in some ways we're kind of turning a traditional uh, commercial post workflow on its head by doing this visual effects work first because normally you would start with you know graded material that you've uh, already kind of decided to look on uh, before you even start this composite. And this is a really interesting way to look at how flexible it can be using uh, Flame Premium to do something like this. And again, here is the, uh, the two batch effects scene that we had seen earlier. Again, completely compatible here uh, with Flame and Smoke. I can go into that same action scene and show you all of the same things that we had looked at before. So I just wanted to, to remind you of, of the, the, the abilities of Flame itself to do its own type of 3D. I've got you know, my, my texture projection here uh, from a Photoshop file. I was able to just convert that into a projector, uh, basically point that at a, a basic cylinder, uh, deform the cylinder using the, uh, the deform mesh, and then apply a, a shader as well to, to create a nice highlight. On, on the glass, so uh, all you know, basic standard tools, but but available here uh, in Flame to to do your own 3D. Okay, so that's great. Now you've done three different kinds of effects, and what's the next step? Now we need to save our timeline for grading. Yeah, now this is kind of an interesting thing that we've done. We've, we've sort of turned the traditional finishing workflow on its head because you normally wouldn't do this level of VFX work if you knew there was color grading that was going to happen. You know, imagine you had uh, raw red files or something. You, you would probably want to do that color grade first. But what's great about Flame Premium is you can actually kind of change that workflow up a little bit because you have a lot of flexibility and a lot of control. So how do you prepare this timeline to go to grading? Well, it's as simple as just saving it into a library. Uh, in this case, I do it manually. I just create a library called For Luster, sort of a Dropbox for Luster. And because we can actually browse from Luster uh, into the Flame and Smoke uh, libraries over Wiretap, we'll be able to just pull, pull that right in. So there's no duplication required. Nope. It's all ready to go. Yeah, it's really simple.